everybody. Uh, good Friday afternoon and uh, welcome again to Dr. Jill Live. And today I have not only a brilliant naturopathic doctor, but one of my dear friends, Dr. Shalise Pratt. We're neighbors in practice and it's just so fun to talk because um, there's so many levels on which we relate and today's gonna be no different. Um, I'm really excited about our topic. We're gonna expand the topic from e EMF, histamine and PEMF. And you'll find out what all those mean and how they're linked if you don't know, if you're like, why in the world are these topics on one presentation? <laughs> um, and Dr. Pratt is not only a wealth of knowledge on this topic, but she's even got some slides to share and just some incredible content. Um, she was the one who first introduced me to PEMF. I had known about it for years, but really the science behind it and sharing some of her patient stories and personal experience. And I'm just a huge fan, as you, if you've heard me talk before now. Um, me and my mat. I, I love it. I use it every day. So we'll get into some of that. Just a little background before I introduce her. Um, if you want to find any of the other um, podcasts or episodes, you can go to YouTube and just search my name, Jill Carnahan. We now have over 60 episodes. Um, we're podcasting. So you will be seeing all of these episodes and more on um, YouTube, Stitcher, all of the apps that you can find podcasting on as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, we'll also have the landing page with transcripts all fully um, written out in case you don't want to listen to the episode, you can read it. So all that coming, just stay tuned. Um, if we do mention any products, my store is just drjillhealth.com. You can find things there. And um, without further ado, I'll introduce my friend, Dr. Shalise Pratt. She is a believer in integrative and holistic medicine. Her practice and clinic focus on neurology and complex medical conditions relating to metabolic disease. She uses functional medicine and her expertise in biochemistry, methylation, and physiology. And she is one of the um, experts on some of these pathways. She's the one I go to if I want to talk about methylation pathways or COMP2 um, mutations or some of these things. We have some really fun discussions. Um, she helps patients get to the root cause of their symptoms through a strategic approach. The modalities she uses in her practice are nutrition. Uh, botanicals, environmental medicine, classic homeopathy, and hydrotherapy. Many patients come to Dr. Pratt's office after seeing other doctors. They're scared, frustrated, and looking for answers that no one's been able to figure out. We both do these medical mysteries. <laughs> she often tells people that she looks at medicine like a detective. She looks for clues that lead to the current health situation with strategy. She will work with you to figure out no matter how complex your health issues and she's been featured on so many different interviews and posts. You can find our previous episode on YouTube, on Facebook here. I don't know what number it is, but if you go back, um, we're uh, recorded here as well. Um, Dr. Pratt, thanks for coming on. It's great to have you here and always fun to talk to a friend and colleague. It's, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. You're welcome. So I always like to start with story and I'd love to know, this is kind of a broad topic. So we'll dive in in just a minute of like, how do they relate defining the terms of that? And of course you can share some slides too, but before we do, why is this relevant to our medicine and how does, have you seen, you know, cases where either your personal life or, or patients where this really, really does make a difference. Give us just a framework of like why you and I are interested in this topic and why it matters to the health of our patients. Well, I think, I think the journey began when I started seeing autistic children way back in 2005, 2006 through 2007. And I became a biomedical doctor, a, a defeat autism now doctor, they were called back then. And we were looking for environmental medicine clues, metabolics, genomics. We wanted to get to the root of why we were seeing these really tough neurological cases that weren't we, we had to individualize care. It wasn't, it wasn't a plug it, a protocol in and everybody got better and you can't throw the kitchen sink at them either, or they just, they don't get better because it overwhelms their kidneys and their liver. So it, it was a journey one step at a time in environmental medicine, I'd say. And um, I know you sit on, on a lot of different um, groups for environmental medicine, but um, electromagnetic frequencies are like smog. It's like smoke that we used to think of in the eighties. Like we'd be around smoke and feel like this is carcinogenic. This is really bad for us. Um, now electro it's called electromagnetic smog is the same thing. And so when we started seeing in practice that this is really impacting people's health, especially if they have Lyme or infections, if they have mycotoxins, if they have uh, chronic fatigue. These were the canaries, right, that first showed up in the practices saying, 
I don't feel well and something's going on and I don't know what it is. And we, we, as doctors had to sleuth it out, figure out what, what is, what is causing this new level of, of, or new exposure to them. Cause we're, we've cleaned up the diet. We, we've done all these other things to support them. And, and we weren't for a long time, we weren't thinking about EMFs because we can't see them. Right. And so we don't know that they're impacting us. And as a personal story, so, I mean, I started helping a lot of patients and on a personal story, uh, my family was in a really terrible car accident three years ago last month. And my husband got um, really hurt and injured and has been disabled since and has been dealing with chronic pain. And you, as well as many um, other wonderful doctors together, we've come together and we've, we've found some really amazing things. But one of the things that I was looking for is pain management Mm -hmm. for my husband. And that's when it all clicked to me when I was at an EMF conference in 2019. And I started learning about PMF and what it did and what it did for metabolism and what it did for nutrient absorption, what it did for oxygen saturation within the cells, what it did for the cells to heal the cells and to manage pain and, and, and actually slow down arthritis, which that's something my husband, um, has. And so personally, you know, there, there's many complications and Dr. Jill, you, you know, many of those, but it was a aha moment when I found PEMF, uh, therapies. And that's when I dove in back, I guess it's almost three years ago, um, to start to really figure out this technology that's actually been around a long time. So then I started telling everyone I knew about, about it. I always credit you. You've heard me say, I just have a doctor friend of mine. <laughs> that's you. If you heard me say that on other, that's, that's Dr. Pratt. And uh, from my perspective, it's same as you, I've known about PMF. I've known practitioners that used it. I've known that there's good science, but when I started, first of all, you had said, Hey, Jill, this is amazing. And all that I knew is the machine that you have is very expensive <laughs> and amazing. Um, and so the, at that price level, I was like, well, how practical is this for patients? And I, I kind of poo-pooed it for a while. Um, and then I got a chance to get one that was at a lot uh, cheaper price rate and, and ended up working okay. But the bottom line is this, it's not about the price or the machine. Um, the technology, when I started diving in, there's such good science. This is NASA science. This is like really it's good. Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. Tesla. Yeah. And, and, and what's <laughs> interesting, and again, I'll let you talk more about the details. Yeah. Just how I got to be a, a convert to PEMF was, was partially through you and your stories and like, Jill, you really need to check this out. And all of these things, what ends up, whether it's EMF or PMF and how they relate, we'll talk about that. Um, it's invisible. So patients aren't always thinking about this, but there's so much power in this electromagnetic spectrum, not only to hurt and harm sales, but to heal. And personally, again, you guys have probably heard me talk about it. I've seen dramatic changes in my energy, my labs, my sleep, and I love objective data. So this is not just Jill feels better. This is like my labs are showing a dramatic improvement in malabsorption things from my gut in my sleep. I look at the, of course, the aura ring and the deep sleep has been sometimes double or triple as before. So there's really objective stuff that I've recipro- you know, uh, reproduced. And so there's no doubt in my mind this works. I want to kind of give it over to you because you've got just such great content and you're going to pull this all together. Um, and if you want to share your slides, you can jump right in and tell us about these, what they are, how they connect and your experience with them. Well, let me just put all of this up for you. So this is just some um, ways that people can get a hold of me. You can find me at the prattclinics.com and this is my clinic. So a lot of people are like, what's the big deal? I know that x-ray is bad for me. I know that radioactive like plutonium and uranium is bad for me. We've known that for a long time. Um, that's called ionizing radiation. But we've had a little bit of confusion about this non-ionizing radiation. And these are things like microwave ovens in your home. And these are things like computers that sit on your lap or next to you. Uh, your smart appliances all over your house, energy meters like smart meters on your house, wi- Wi-Fi routers, cell phones, Bluetooth devices, power lines, and MRI. They're all full of non- non-ionizing radiation that we used to think, not a big deal, but collectively, it's becoming a very big deal. Um, and I also ranked these in, in terms of uh, least 
least ionizing to most um, non-ionizing. So this is stronger than say the microwave oven, but think about, I just want you to think about the collective effect of your home when you think about all the smart technology we've brought in along with alarm systems and you know, making sure our thermostat is on a smart set and we can walk into a room and it turns a certain temperature. Well, that all has Wi-Fi running through your house bombarding you. Um, and we're gonna talk about, you know, what the implications of that are. And so, so if I can just give a really practical sure. example. So I had a building biologist come to my house. You can have someone come and measure these. So if you wonder, there are building biologists out there that will come to your house and actually yeah. look at your house. And my shocker was, um, she had me lie in my bed on my bedroom where I sleep and she mm -hmm. measured my body voltage and she measured it with the master switch off and on. So either all my electricity off or on. The difference was tenfold. It was 3000, whatever the units are and my body when the everything was on. And again, my bedroom, a few lamps, there was, there was nothing, there's no smart meters there or anything else. I do have a sleep number bed, which has electricity on it as well. And then when we turn that off, just the master switch to my bedroom, it went down to 300, which is actually safe. 3000 is not safe. I just wanted to put that in perspective because I have a pretty clean home and pretty low Wi-Fi from what I think. And I was shocked at the amount that was measurable in my bedroom. Same kind of story. I'll share my personal experience. So we had a building biologist and in here, I'm, I gave them websites for building okay. biologists, both the, the um, Institute for Building Biology, as well as Jeremy Johnson's um, website, which he knows all the build building biologists all over the country, if not the world. He's a wonderful resource. Um, he has a great uh, TED talk too, but I was not feeling well in my home and I wondered why. Well, there were multiple reasons, but first we, the first thing I, I was okay with was finding out, you know, what our EMF situation was. And he walked into our bedroom and he was like, what is sending this off? Like the meter just went off. I can't remember how high it went, but he said he'd never seen it so high. So he was thinking it was like a drone sitting outside our window. What was it? You know what it was? It was our printer. Wow. It was the, it was the Wi-Fi sending out from the printer for, you know, for to pick up the signal to print something. Wow. And so we learned we had to turn off our printer, which is in the office right next to our bedroom every night. Otherwise we're bombarding ourselves with EMF. Wow. So it's these little, and the other thing that was really high in something called EMR, which is electromagnetic radiation was a sleep, a noisemaker. It was, all it was, was a noisemaker on the, on the floor. And it was sending out all kinds of dirty electricity. And so you learn, you start to learn, and I have some slides in here and I have some, um, the environmental health trust is a great website for you all to know about. And that gives great I, I, you know, ideas about where to go through in your home to kind of get the low, they call it low hanging fruit. And then you bring in a building biologist and they create a whole report. Mm -hmm. So, so wonderful. And they, they show you how to set up kill switches so you can make your bedroom like you're sleeping in nature. So yes, absolute. Thanks, Jill. That's, it's great to have that story. So who is this harming besides humans? We know it's harming us at this point. We have lots of research to support and you're gonna hear about all the, the symptoms that go along with it, but we've got immune system dysfunction. We've got increase in bacteria and fungal resistance even to our antibiotics and our antifungals because of EMF. EMF is starting to show that bacteria and fungus not only grow faster in, in high EMF environments, but they also become resistant to our our medicines. So, um, and then we have fertility problems. We we know that, um, but it's also harming our insects. There's a huge problem with bees, and we're we're hoping that we are coming up with solutions. But we we don't know all of the ramifications of this electromagnetic fields that we're producing to our plants, our animals, and our insects. You know, we just don't know what we're doing. So, um, we're still trying to figure that out. Wow, look at all of the things that. Um, EMF exposure or when you have um, sensitivity to electromagnetics, there are people that like literally cannot go in a building that has Wi-Fi. Um, and the reason why I started these is because look how many of these also are associated with histamine. And maybe some of you didn't know that these symptoms were related to histamine. Um, Jill, what do you, what do you think of this list? 
<laughs> yeah, gosh, I, that's why I love I, I was so excited for you to start telling us about this because at first glance, when you see the title EMF, histamine and PEMF, you're like, first of all, what is EMF? What is PMF? And then what does histamine have to do with it? Well, clearly there's a connection because it's such a correlated list. And, you know, you'll talk about this, I'm sure, but whether it's, um, it's kind of like poking the bear, whatever pokes the immune system or pokes the system, EMF is one of them, mold is another, infections are another, can cause our own mast cells to throw out excess histamine. And this is one of those things that can do that, right? Absolutely. Uh, we, we have, I'm going to show you some research uh, after this slide eventually. Uh, that shows we're starting to see more and more the correlation be between mast cell dysregulation, which mast cells are the, they're like little balloons that hold your, your histamine inside. And when they pop, they release all that histamine out into your blood. Uh, and so when you are exposed to a lot of EMF, which let's talk about junior high kids, high school kids for a second and college kids, they all have their devices. They're all in a room next to all the other kids with devices. They all have their phones on them and their computers. They have their Apple watches, and then they have a router right above them. Mm -hmm. All of these devices are being tested alone to say, this is safe, this is safe, this is safe. But when you collectively look at how much when we get into a room full of devices, it's exponential. And, in, and we also know in a lot of those schools, we have mold growth. A lot of them, a lot of those schools, whether they're junior high, high school or college um, buildings, they have mold. Well, that's gonna trigger a compounding result of these kind of symptoms. Even without the mold, without Lyme, without other infections, you can get a burn on your face just from sitting in front of your computer. I saw, um, I saw some, some pictures today reading through the research of a before and after when somebody was on their computer for like two hours, their hands were red yeah. when they got up. And that wasn't even with them, um, with it on their lap, it was on a, a, a table. Mm -hmm. So there's EMF that's impacting, we're having skin and burns, they almost look like chemical burns in there from electromagnetic frequencies are coming off of our devices. So, but if you see this list, I'm just kind of letting it hang out. I don't want to read every one of these, but many of these are also associated with histamine. So it, it made people start to wonder, like, you know, it, it also makes it really hard. Somebody may be coming in with ADD and like eczema, and it's not just that they have allergies to their environment, but they're maybe on their game console and have a phone in their pocket all the time. And that's the reason why they have eczema. That's the reason why they have shortness of breath or asthma. That's the reason why we may need to, we may miss it. That's what I'm saying is a lot of us miss these symptoms. So a wonderful man in the environmental medicine world. In fact, he's kind of one of the grandfathers, wouldn't you say, Jill? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Ray. Yeah. Um, he had a clinic, an environmental medicine clinic, and he, he created this barrel approach. I'd, I had never seen it before, Dr. Ray. Had you, no, Jill? Yeah. Which is, he, he was brilliant. Anyway, you, you can see all of these, all of these different chemicals, infections, um, pollens, um, environmental toxins, they all add up. And some of them make us more sensitive to EMF. A lot of them do, especially mercury amalgams, heavy lead, lead, uh, heavy lead burden in, in our in our body, even gold fillings. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that have actually reported that they can pick up on signals if they have enough amalgams in their mouth, they can actually hear things like that are over radio waves, which, wow, that's, that's, in, that's intense. So we, are, we, we have to put it all together. And I just wanna remind any doctor that's watching this or patient that if you've been really confused this is how complicated it gets. We have to look for all of these things sometimes in these really complex chemical sensitivity, you know, long-term chronic infections. Wouldn't you say, Jill? Absolutely. Uh, I love that you're saying that. And it really is the thing, the elephant in the room is our total toxic load per Dr. Ray um, is increasing every year exponentially. So even 10 years ago, the amount, I, I don't know what the numbers are and how much more Wi-Fi and how much more radiation we have, but it's literally the curve is not, um, you know, doubling, it's exponentially rising. It is, it is. And this isn't all going to be bad news, but 
these are pieces that we have to pay attention to. Like what, what we've found, you'll see in some of the studies what, as we go on is even people that seem normal have no histamine response are, res are, are showing changes after spending time on technology. So it's just something either as a doctor, or as a patient to know exists. So this is my bread and butter, my practice. I love reading genetics. I really like um, strategy because it kind of puts all this pathway together and you see the genes kind of in, in motion, which I like to think about it as, as, as a big picture. Mm -hmm. A lot of you may have heard about MTHFR and that's kind of the sexy, most famous gene of this metabolic pathway. But what I wanna bring up here is that this is really complicated. And if you're a patient, you don't have to understand this other than this is the folate cycle. And eventually we wanna go over here and make something called SAM. And SAM is your universal methyl donor that turns on and off many other enzymes. It's really important for making new tissues, your neurochemistry, your ability to break down histamine. There's so many, you know, repairing your DNA. We need all, all of that. We need SAMe for all of that, this methyl donor, and it's our master methyl donor. And so what happens is we go through this folate cycle. And if you see mine, this purple means this is mine. Um, this purple means it's slow. It doesn't do it really well. So my lifestyle and having a clean lifestyle is pretty essential. But you come over here to something called MTR and this MTRR and imagine it's like a cog in a wheel. And the more oxidative stress we have, the more um, infections, the more heavy metals we have, the more um, toxic burden we have, it's like a stone gets stuck in that, that cog and it's not working very well. It's really limping to move. And that means that all of this work can't get over here to make SAM. And so what's a rate limiting step often? This choline. So a lot of doctors really, we need, and, and patients, if you're out there, if you have EMF sensitivity, if you have chronic illness, if you have mold, we really need to work on methylation. And sometimes the answer just isn't 5-MTHF. Um, right. It's sometimes, and B12, sometimes it's giving choline or riboflavin to really, or creatine to help the cycle move past. And it means that doctor needs to keep working and be patient with them because they need to keep working on bringing down the reason why this cog is getting stuck. And it's, and it's, a, and it's very essential. We need to get this to work, right, Jill? So. Yes, and I would just mention, because if you're a patient out there or, or you have had your doctor give you, there's even prescription versions of methylfolate that are incredibly high dose. And I have seen more often than not, probably you too, Dr. Pratt, because we see these sensitive patients where patients are giving five, 10, 15 milligrams of methylfolate with no other intervention in a toxic environment, they crash and burn because what you're doing is you're upregulating this detox pathway. But I think of it as like taking an old Model T Ford and running it at hundred miles an hour on a racetrack, everything's shaking right rattling and flying off, falling apart. And the patient's not able to go at that pace and the toxic load is so high. So I love, I just want to bring it home what you said, because if you're out there and you just think your doc says, oh, you need methylation, there's one size fits all. It's not going to work that easily, usually, especially if there's more, and especially those high doses, because you're pushing this system to its capacity and it, it doesn't work. Think about it as a, I love uh, Dr. Lynch, actually, I got this from him. When you give too much methylfolate, it just ends up being like a recycle bin that's, that's overflowing and not going anywhere if this isn't moving. And so you're, you're actually creating more for your body to deal with mm -hmm. than you're doing anything with. And I've seen the same thing, Jill. I love your Ford you know, kind of falling apart. Um, some of those people though, they get, they stop like on a dime and they can't function. Like they feel really good on high dose methylfolate and then they crash on the other side because it's, it's, they get to a point where they've saturated and this pathway can't, isn't moving. And it's not the B12 and folate. It's that we've got to take care of the, the redox. Why, why is it slowing down? And we have to give it other support over here with choline, betaine, um, yes. you know, creatine and, and, and uh, riboflavin. Mm -hmm. So this is just a quick kind of methylation talk, but I wanted to bring it home with histamine because it's, I think EMF, I'll talk to, you know, the people over at Seeking Health, we'll probably add EMF over here and EMF up here, because I really think it is impacting the release and the, the, the gene trying to manage and, 
what what happens with histamine what's what's happening is you know anytime we have inflammation infection because i really think it is imp- are are we okay yeah <laughs> okay so i i think high stress catecholamines cause us to to dump histamine and then we can take it two different ways and i just want to give everybody a little bit of context there are things that are happening. I don't know if you saw that list and resonated. It may not be EMF that's causing your histamine issues. Lots of things cause histamine issues, right, Jill? Yes. Um, but it can go down into the GI and then it's more of an enzyme. Then you take an enzyme called DAO or you come over here and we're managing release, mm-hmm. but there's offsets to managing that release. Many people are taking a lot of quercetin these days. And they're stressed out and they can't sleep and they don't know why. Yes. We all know that quercetin, although it helps those mast cells stay together a little bit better, and that would help a little bit with EMF too, they cause COMT, which is an enzyme that breaks down norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine, and it slows it down so you hold on to that longer. So you're up later and you can't sleep or you wake up three hours after you fall asleep and you're wondering why. So I have a very funny story about that, Dr. Pratt. (laughs) I was, uh, this was not even too long ago and I know better, but I like to experiment on myself. And I was in the office one day and I don't know if I had some exposure that I knew was allergenic to me. And so I use quercetin as an antihistamine and I don't use a lot of it because I have a COMT plus plus, just like you said. So what happens is that stops that breakdown of norepinephrine, epinephrine and estrogens. And then you'll feel kind of anxious, rest up. Well, I'm not typically an anxious person. I know better than to to take a lot. I don't know what I was thinking. I took five caps, 2,500 of course it didn't because I was, I didn't want to get all allergic that drive home. I was like, you know how you feel after you just get in a car accident and you're like, Oh, you're just shaking. And internally you're like just dying. I was like, Oh, I think my adrenaline is like sky high because of that course. <laughs> but it was so funny. Cause I was like, well, if I ever want to feel like totally, like I just got out of a car accident, I know how to, to do it. It'll just take those five courses. <laughs> and, and we like the Goldilocks principle. We like to have just the right amount, not too much, not too little. But uh, green tea extract is, does that sometimes for some people too. So, yeah. so I'm just giving you some ideas about some things of why maybe you took some of these things to help manage histamine, even, whether it was EMF exposure, whether it's mold that you have in your world, or whether it's seasonal allergies or Epstein-Barr, or some kind of infection that's causing um, histamine, you know, yeast overgrowth, even in the GI will cause histamine uh, intolerance. And some of these other, some of these great things to, to stabilize our mast cells can mess with our neurochemistry, but that's not today's lesson. And maybe someday I'll, I'll come back and we can talk about biochemistry with methylation. Cause I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So here's some studies. I just wanted to show you, this is, this is well-documented. We're pretty clear about what's going on, but, um, mast cells are activated and we are finding EMFs, um, are, are, basically making that dendritic cell or the mast cell, that's what MC is standing for in here, just to degranulate these cells and then these inflammatory substances like histamine um, make our skin be red or you get, you see somebody's really flushed. And, you know, I especially think about these boys or men on the game or some women um, and they have red cheeks afterwards and their hands are all red and a little swollen and clammy. They're, they're actually, there's a ton of dopamine that's being dumped while they're playing the game, but the EMFs and that the histamine just goes straight up. So it's just something I'm hoping that you all put together when, when you're thinking about these things. Um, And then this study was really interesting to me. They were looking at computer screens and TVs personal computers and they took healthy individuals and they took more sensitive individuals and they thought that the healthy individuals wouldn't have any change. And what I highlighted here is to their great surprise, they, they changed too. They had a, they had a reaction, even though they, they weren't prone to histamine intolerance. So it's just going to show that there is a a reaction here. And, you know, histamine also opens up the blood brain barrier where if you have heavy metal toxicity, if you have mold illness, if you have chronic illness, when we run high histamine, 
we're opening up that blood, blood brain barrier. We're letting things in. So I'm just kind of showing you the, this is from um, a French doctor. And um, I listened to a wonderful um, presentation he gave at the EMF conference in 2019. And this was one of his slides that I just thought was a, a great takeaway of how um, this, this model is it's being comprised of how we're thinking about it. Did you want to go over any of this or can I move No, on? I just love that you're mentioning that. And for you guys listening, if you have leaky gut, same thing. Basically, any membrane histamine will increase permeability. So it could, like uh, vascular capillaries, cause more increased permeability and more swelling or edema, um, extra you know, tissue space of fluid. It could cause leaky gut. So if you have a ton of EMF exposure and more histamine, you might get more sensitive to foods and have more food sensitivities. Um, or more reactions post mealtime. So these, it's not just the brain, although that's such a big one because of our uh, brain function. And, and like Dr. Pratt mentioned, the toxic metals, or if we have infections in our sinuses that can go right into the brain as well. But really leaky membranes all over the body will increase with histamine. Which both Dr. Carnahan and many of my patients have experienced. I think you've shared your story of having that pitting edema from your mold exposure and you had leaky, leaky capillaries um, especially in your lower limbs, you got so much swelling and that was a big histamine response as well as leaky capillaries, wouldn't you? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I just want to talk about reducing exposure for a minute. There's, we could spend hours talking about this and I encourage you go to, to the environmental health trust. They have trust. They have a lot of free information for you. Um, so just always keeping your devices as far from you as possible. I, I get really um, worried when I see women tuck their cell phones into their bra or I see them um, carry it in the back of their pants because we've seen an increase in cancer wherever that, that phone is stored on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, the, when we have it up to our head, the rate of gliomas have gone way up and also heart tumors have gone up as well by people putting their cell phones on their chest. So. It's just, it's, it's really remarkable when you start to look at the studies, how much that radiation is, is pouring into your body and causing cellular mutation. So getting things away, you know, not keeping them on your body, using airplane mode whenever you can. I know some of us don't have landlines anymore. If that's the case, um, you may want to turn off Wi-Fi, but you can keep your phone away, maybe in, in an, in a room that's far away from your bed or as far away within your room as you can. Um, so a distance matters. You're gonna see that over and over. And turning off Bluetooth. So, I mean, I, I was on the phone with one of my patients last week and she was telling me about all these wonderful things she's doing to clean up her environment. And I had to be at the end of the call. And now I want you to get rid of your AirPods because they're Bluetooth and they're constantly pinging. If you get a meter, you hear what it sounds like and, and then you actually have a, you have some kind of sensation to tie it to. So we just, these little things can actually make a big difference in your health. Just having kind of headphones like I have that are wired, um, they, they're getting ethernet when you can and plugging in, this all reduces your exposure. There's, it's not, Bing, binging you with radiation. So um, let's see, yeah, keeping a distance, working offline more often, and again, courting. So these are all important. I think it's really, really important to talk about kids real quick. I was one of the people that let my kid play with an iPad, like he watched the backyard again um, on flights. And I look back and you know, it was made my life a lot easier. I would do it a little differently now that I know how much EMF comes off of a, of a device, but they have thinner skulls. They have smaller heads when, when they do have a lot of EMF exposure in utero, um, develop, they're developing their brain. We see more leukemia in kids that have higher, um, exposure to EMF. And, um, we really don't want to set our phone on our belly when we're pregnant. That's just giving a direct uh, we're, we're just sending a lot of radiation right to our unborn child. What many of us don't know is whether it's drugs, EMF, um, you know, vaccines, they're all tested on adult men. They're not tested on children and they're not tested on women. So these, th these limits, radiation limits, 
are very different for women and children than they are for men. And so it's just something to think about. And lifetime exposure matters and compounding, like I said, the Apple Watch, the computer, the router, and all your friends around you having the same, that compounds the amount that we're getting exposed to. So here's those resources for you. You can stop this video later and write them down. I wish that I may be able to put them in the comment section if you need me to, Jill. I'll be sure. Um, I'll do that for you. <laughs> yeah, the Environmental Health Trust is, is a wealth of information and the doctor that runs that is very, um, she's very, helping everyone to understand more about 5G and the risks that come along with electromagnetic smog. Um, and the building biologists, they can come to your home like Jill and I had and tell you, you know, what, how to make your home safe. So what are the solutions to all of this? And now we're gonna get into the third topic that we, that we just said we would discuss today. But just real quick, I think you should find a good doctor. There, there, there are many of us out there. If you, if you um, search, you know, most, you can find naturopathic doctors. You can reach out to Dr. Jill and I, if you can't see one of us. Um, changing your diet to organic, rich in antioxidants, low uh, pro-inflammatory foods. These are basics. Supporting neurological health with um, omega-3 fatty acids and the DHEA to EPA is one-to-one. -one. It's not, you're not gonna be looking for one more than the other. You really want a lot of both. Um, vitamin D3, again, to support your immune response as well as your neuro neurological system. Electrolytes are really disturbed when we have EM, EMF sensitivity or EHS um, histamine problems. So getting on a good electrolyte, um, I really like seeking health and it's just back in, in stock. If you were wondering, um, that one just came back. Uh, there are other really great ones out there. Jill, do you have another one that you love? No, and well, it really depends on, I don't want to get too complex, but yeah. sodium to potassium ratios. So our really severe adrenal patients need higher sodium to potassium. So you can look and you can just calculate yourself if it's like two to one, that's better for severe adrenal issues. But where, what we're talking about, what we want is high potassium to sodium ratios. I love Seeking Health. There's no, no one else out there that has a five to one ratio and Seeking Health has 500 to about 90 to hundred of potassium to sodium. So look at your electrolytes because it does matter um, what the ratio is. Right. So supporting the adrenal glands, this is also helping hydration as well. And many people that have adrenals dysfunction are low in sodium, um, but some people are sensitive, right? It, it'll make them have more leaky, yeah. leaky um, vessels. So we have to watch that sodium, but supporting the adrenal glands with, um, with adaptogens and things like that, you can talk to your doctor about it. Managing histamine with the things that, you know, don't overstimulate you, of course. Um, reducing oxidative stress. Now, peroxynitrate and methylmercury are big problems with EMF sensitivity. Um, so antioxidants, and one that Jill and I both are really excited about is hydrogen tablets or hydrogen um, inhalation, right? Jill, have you ever done a podcast on that? I haven't, but often they bring out my machine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, it's, it's incredibly helpful for EHS. Um, or, or having sensitivity to, to these EMFs. So fiber helps, you know, phase three detoxification, um, really good fiber, and, and of course, replacing nutrients that, you know, your doctor would find would be either high or low. Um, removing amalgams, like mm -hmm. I said, heavy metals are a big problem in being sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies. And then a low EMF sauna or blanket, which, I think um, Jill talked a little bit about a higher dose um, elect elect I think they make an EMF, low EMF sauna blanket that you can get. Um, we both like high tech health. I think both of us love that company. I think both of us have had it in our offices at one point or another, mm -hmm. um, which sauna just helps us detoxify. detoxify. Now let's talk about pulsed electromagnetic uh, frequencies. So, what is magnetic field therapy? Like that's what PMF comes from. And it's using magnets, whether they're static or dynamic to create fields to treat and maintain health. And the earth has its own resonance and it produces electromagnetic fields. So there are patients that I have had over the years that feel anxious, restless. Um, they don't feel good. And I just ask them go outside and lay down 
on the earth. You don't need anything fancy or go for a walk in nature or walk on the, wherever you can go to walk on the beach or be in nature, you get bombarded with, um, it's, it's negative ions, right, Jill? And when we get bombarded with those ions, we actually, we start to calm down. It's having too many positive ions that is different. Yeah, have you ever noticed in a lightning thunderstorm or rainstorm, or if you go to vacation on the beach and all of a sudden you're like, I feel so good. And obviously we're on vacation or we might, you know, there's other reasons, but there is actually a, a powerful effect just walking barefoot on the beach or being outside or uh, just after an electrical, like a lightning or thunderstorm or rainstorm. And these are the reason why we feel better is that negative ion. Yeah. And so it's the Schumann resonance that's created by that lightning, Jill. I don't know if you yes. knew that, but it's extremely low frequency. That's the elf mm -hmm. at 7.83 is the average that goes up and down. I am not a mathematician. So Shalise, that's the one that changed my deep sleep. It's seven to eight hertz. And it is absolutely, that is the game changer. It's like, and I always tell patients if I'm discussing it, it's like if I was sleeping on the ground in a sleeping bag, right? Right. And that's... <laughs> That's, that's what PEMF is trying to achieve on a certain level is trying to help your, you ground that you feel that electron, uh, electric pulse that the earth would give you. So this is trying to give, we, we once lived on the earth, right? And we didn't have lights and we didn't have technology and we didn't have cars and we slept on the earth. And in some ways that was so much more restorative to our, we are electrosensitive beings. And you'll see in the history um, that we are connected through our, our, our electricity that runs through our own body. And we do resonate and constantly are pinging back and forth between us and the earth. So sometimes just getting and sitting on the earth. I, I know Jill and I have taken hikes where we take off our shoes and put our feet on the ground. And, you know, it's just so peaceful for your body. So you'll see there's a long history. It's not new. PEMF is not a new phenomenon and we've been using it throughout history. And yeah, um, the father of toxicology used these um, load stones, they were called, and they were magnetic stones and he would treat seizures and psychiatric disorders back in the 1500s. He was already using magnetic therapies. And then, you know, it just kept going on. This Franz Mesmer out of Germany, he had animal magnetism, a natural energy of transference between all things, that we are all energy and we are transferring energy. So, and then Samuel Hahnemann used, I mean, homeopathy as an energy-based mm -hmm. medicine. Um, and he used magnets also in his treatments. And then Faraday, he created electromagnetism. He kind of came up with and contributed a lot to that, that um, study. Then each one of these, again, Tesla developed the coil that we use in PEMF to create the different um, sign, the different waves. They're all different. There's jagged, mm -hmm. there's rectangular, and it's how we set the machine up to deliver this, this field that that it, it can be tuned in to what you need. So somebody that needs bone healing, it's gonna to be totally different than somebody like Jill who just needs to lay on a low frequency and her body starts to increase oxygen absorption, her circulation, her microcirculation changes dramatically. Her red blood cells, they, they, they get into these stacks and they all break apart so that she can actually have better circulation when she's on that mat or anyone's on PEMF. So, Anyway, there's, it's made its progress. I mean, a lot of people looked at it as for what it could contribute to, to um, astronauts that went further than our gravitational pull out in space so that they wouldn't have bone loss and things like that. So NASA has developed uh, techniques around it. And so it's been in Europe though for years. I mean, I think for the last hundred years, we've had it in Europe. It started in Hungary and moved across Europe and it it didn't make it to the United States, I think, until the 60s or 70s. So again, what is PEMF? What is a mat? Or sometimes they there's um, uh, like pieces that can come off of it, like people with migraines could wear like a coil around their head. Or let's say you have a shoulder that you just had surgery on and you want healing, they can put a coil on your shoulder. But I, I like this generalized um, ability to lay down on a mat mm -hmm. and you to experience a low frequency and 
all these shifts for pain relief, for energy, for digestion, for repair, um, to enhance sleep. So these are, um, these are all the ways in which it's used and you use different frequencies based on the, the technology that you have. And there's lots of different technologies out there. Again, I think higher dose, they have a, a, a far infrared mat that also has PEMF. Um, Jill gave those to all of her, her office people, um, lucky people. And um, yeah, they're really affordable. Those mats are great. Um, and if you want medical grade, you can find doctors like myself who have more of the fancy units mm -hmm. that we can do a little bit more with, but yeah. it, you don't need it. Not everybody needs that level. So that was what I prepared today. Oh, Shalise, this has been amazing. And uh, hopefully for you guys listening, this just ties it all together because um, it, it just makes so much sense. And it's funny because sadly EMFs and Wi-Fi has gotten so politicalized. It's really not a political issue. It's just a basic science issue. And the sad thing is Dr. Pratt and I are, are the reason we're talking about this is because we see patients that are suffering and we wanna help them and heal them and find the answers. And what we've seen in our clinical practice is for many of our patients, this really does make a difference. Um, as you could see all the resources Dr. Pratt had, I will be sure here and on YouTube, wherever you find this uh, to include links to her clinic and to include links to all the resources that she shared and to include links to the higher dose. And uh, both of us love the high tech health sauna in Boulder. Uh, they're actually local here, but you know, it's funny, I went to Switzerland and guess what they had? They had the high tech health from Boulder. So it's a really good unit, um, but there's also the sleeping bag mats. There's a the little ones you can sit in. And you know, I was talking to someone the other day, I think it was Lynn Patrick, um, you can just put a space heater in your bathroom and close the door. If that's all you have and you sweat, that's the key there for detox. That's a whole nother topic. We didn't talk about infrared sauna, but you don't always have to get the most expensive devices, which is, you know, what, what we're talking about here today. Um, but any way that you can reduce your exposure um, will be helpful. Um, any last like words of wisdom or parting comments, Dr. Pratt, that you have for everybody? Well, I just, I, I always like when I go over topics that can be scary or we can get overwhelmed by the amount of information or what's working against us in environmental medicine is the resilience of our soul and the resilience of us yeah. as a human as a human being in, in a collective and i just want to remind everyone to um keep a, a positive mindset you know find one thing to be grateful for every day and that's going to bring down those those peroxy nitrates and those lipid uh, and lipid peroxidation, anything that could be attacking you from these environmental medicine perspectives. And it's, it's about making little choices all the time that lead us to our biggest success. So maybe it's drinking more water today, or maybe it's saying no to maybe a sugary snack. Um, just like all of those things, you can start to incorporate some of these things and they don't have to be expensive but hopefully you got something that you could do even today. Maybe you unplug your router tonight when you go to sleep, or maybe you set it on a timer, or maybe you go to the environmental health uh, trust and you see, oh, I didn't know the baby monitor was pinging me so much and I will sleep so much better without doing that. And I have a different solution. There's other solutions building biologists can come up. So there are always solutions. That's what I'm trying to say. I love that, uh, Shalise, because again, sometimes it's, it's funny because most of the environmental medicine conferences that we go to, especially the first day, it's like, whoa, everything's bad. We're all going to die. <laughs> Right. So, but I think you did a really good job of framing it. There's practical things. There's frame things that are free. There's that so you can turn your phone off at night. There's, there's very simple things you can do and not be overwhelmed. And uh, this isn't all doom and gloom. And you definitely brought that today. Thank you so much for this great information. I can already see likes and, and uh, comments. People have really enjoyed this and I'm sure more will come and watch. Thank you again. It's my honor. Great to see you. You are such a dear friend to me and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you.